Bob uh, Evan sent me a little joke uh, this week. Evidently, there was a man whose wife was attacked by a dog. And she's lying there in the street, and he calls 911. He says, my wife has been attacked. Someone come and take her to the hospital. And uh, 911 says, uh, where are you? And he says, well, we're on Eucalyptus Street. And the lady says, how do you spell it? Uh, he said, then he says, how about if I drag her over to Oak Street and you can pick her up there? <laughs> Here 911 can heal people and they can save people's lives and they can put out fires, but they can't spell eucalyptus. And I just want to ask you today as we wrestle with these questions, is that also true of God? Are there some, some things that God seems to be able and willing to do, but other things he just doesn't do? Somehow he can send money every month for five years. Doesn't stop the bullets but he heals from the bullets. Why does it have to be like this? Why does he pick and choose? Sometimes we have two guys here that have uh, had a store at South Coast Plaza. They put their, their credit cards on the line, got a whole stack of credit cards, maxed them out, and just absolutely feel that God has blessed them to have that store there. They got a rate to rent it, about 10% of everyone else in the store until two weeks ago when the mall gave them a letter saying, you have to leave. We're putting someone else in that'll pay us more. Why was God on this end and not on this end? Big article in Christianity Today, this last issue, by the bakers in Mozambique. I've read the book, always enough. Husband and wife, and they've been down there in Mozambique, and there are, people went down there to check this out. There are healings and people being raised from the dead. They call for everyone who is deaf to come and they bring them back to hearing and back, back problems and all kinds of things. In the last few years, 10,000 small churches all over Mozambique, hundreds of thousands of dollars of food for poor people and flood victims and so on. But not everyone is healed. And when they take the same sermons and take them over to Singapore or here to America or to Europe, nobody is healed. Same sermon, same prayer, same ministry. Why they're not here? Why not? Why not all the time? Where is God in all of this? I wrestled with some of the miracle stories that I've told you and just start thinking about them again. You remember the one about the guy in Burma with the key? He buried the key in his front yard. The river comes, floods it away. Wife cooks a fish, opens up the fish, and there is the key. Why, if you can find the key in the fish, why did they, God allow the key to be lost in the first place? And why do all the miracles show up before someone gets baptized, but after the husband got baptized, there were no more miracles like that. We were having Sabbath dinner in Chicago. The older lady there said when she was younger, they were going on a canoe trip in Camp Osabal in Michigan at our camp. I've been on the river. Fast-moving rapids and rocks and all the rest and her glasses fell off the bottom of the river. The river's still moving. She's still moving. She got a little group of people together and said, I have to have those glasses. Let's pray. She prayed. Now they've gone another half a mile or a mile down the river, and she finished the prayer, and she looked down to the bottom of this creek. There were the glasses bumping along the creek. Has somehow gone, how? Why doesn't he find all the stuff that we lose? Like my debit card. And you remember the Romanian kitten? Remember that story? The pastor who had the kitten got up on the tree, wouldn't come down. He tied the rope to the tree, began, the tree began to bend. The rope broke. The tree sprung. The cat went flying over the house. <laughs> Little girl was praying for a kitten to come to her house, and here comes a cat flying through the... <laughs> now why does God have to take a cat away from somebody in order to give a cat to a little girl? Isn't God... Just make another cat. Hard questions about God. How do we sort all this out? Is the problem that if we just had more faith? If somehow we had more faith, there would be more miracles, and the helicopter would come. 
and people would be healed that we pray for, and no one would have their houses foreclosed, and people would not leave their store in South Coast Plaza, and paraplegics in our wheelchairs that are here every week would be get up and walk. If we had more faith, is that what it is? And the problem, there aren't more miracles because we don't have enough faith. Is it ours, or is it God? Is somehow the problem with God that God doesn't play by any set rules, and we get up on certain mornings, then he does all kinds of miracles, and he blesses people, and he heals, and he does, sends money for helicopters. Other days, he doesn't feel like it, and so he does not heal and doesn't answer the prayers. Why does God sometimes seem to heal the little stuff and not the liver cancers and the paraplegics and the quadriplegics and all the other? Why? Hard to understand. Does faith make a difference? Would there be more miracles right now if you and I had more faith? Or is it really God? Those are the hard, 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 hard questions. Now let me ask you a few more about faith. Big article this week in Leadership Magazine. Challenging article. This man has been a youth leader in the world, the national church. He was invited to speak at a big youth conference and they had all kinds of youth games and they were you know, eating pizza, and they were pushing uh, eggs across the floor with their nose and all the usual youth things. And finally, the last one was, he said, I lay down, and they made an ice cream sundae on my face. And then when it was all done, they wiped all that away, and now it's time for the devotional. And he said, we got into a circle, and the young youth pastor got up, and he spoke. And he said, you know, it's not that hard to be a Christian. Nothing will change. You will not lose all your friends at school. You will not become unpopular. Nothing will change. Your life will stay about this. Just better. And this guy said, is that the gospel? While he's talking and doing the devotional, kids were throwing Dorito chips on each other. Other kids were whispering. Other kids were texting. Here's the gospel. And the article asked this question. The vast majority of kids go to a youth group and they accept Christ. 65% say that they were converted at some point in their life, usually in high school, when they have a youth pastor who's terrific and there's pizza and there's games and beach vespers and all the rest. But between high school and 29, they said if you take all the young adults and put them into one picture, you would have to take a big fat marker and cross off three-fourths of them. Statistics show that 80% are gone by the year 29. And my question is, we baptized a wonderful young girl, about a 29. Will she have the kind of faith today that will get through those years? You young adults, will your faith that you have established here in youth, will it now stay? That's why we're starting a young adult service. We refuse to give up 80% of our young adults. Amen? We refuse that. What kind of faith are you building? And will it go through that time when you have to answer the hard questions? What if you died while you were in that young adult time period? What if Jesus comes during the young adult period when you're not close to God? Magic Johnson grew up Adventist, grew up as a Christian, lived a crazy life, and someone came up to him, how come you're living like this when you grew up as a Christian? And he said, I'm young, I'm rich, that's what I'm going to do. God is going to have to wait. I'll get back to God when I'm older. In the meantime, got HIV. Got an email last night, 1 o'clock in the morning. One of our members, who's not well herself, said to me that she just uh, had her brother, who was going to come to church for the first time in his 50s, a few weeks ago. But before he actually came, he ended up with two strokes. He's in the hospital today, and his wife served him with divorce papers. And he said to her, prayer doesn't work, and God is useless. It doesn't make a difference. You can forget about church. She's going today to try to do something to try to change his mind. What do we do with God? Anyway, we're in a faith series. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews 11. We're going through Hebrews 11, character by character, verse by verse. Eric just read uh, the verses for today. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, the story of Noah. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. 
You know the story. God creates a perfect world. It begins to go south. A couple thousand years later, we don't know how long. It has gone so bad, literally it had gone to hell. And it says God, it grieved God, and he decided he was going to wipe out the whole world. Start over again. He asked Noah to build an ark. And you remember the story. Remember the number 500? Noah is 500 miles from any water, any ocean. He's never seen rain, never seen a boat, never seen an ocean. Middle of a desert, and God says, build a boat. 500 miles from the ocean, 500 feet long. It fits 500 freight trains in the boat. <clears throat> and how old was Noah when the flood came? Do you remember? Anybody remember? 600 years old. How old was Noah when he had children? 500 years old. How long did Noah preach? 120 years. How old was Noah when he began to preach? 480. Didn't have children for 20 more years. He's got 18,000 tons of lumber out in front of the front yard. He's beginning to lay out the outlines of a boat. Neighbor comes over. What are you building? I'm building a boat. What are you building a boat for? Save my children when we have a flood. How many children are you planning to have? How many do you have right now? Zero. 20 years before he had children, Noah builds a, builds a boat 500 feet long. Crazy faith. This is faith that does not live within a box, doesn't put God within a box, is willing to go beyond what they've always seen before, does not say, do we have enough money? What are the policies? How much money is in the fund? Is anyone else doing it like this? This is crazy faith. Willing to stretch out. And go beyond the boundaries that we've always done before. When's the last time you did something crazy like Noah did? When's the last time you jumped out of an airplane or did something really crazy like try a new kind of food in a restaurant? When's the last time you paid more tithes and offerings than you really could afford? to make sure that God would have to do something to make this balance out at the end of the month. Put your kids in Orangewood when you have no idea how you're going to pay for it. When's the last time you took your helicopter and went around the world on a credit card to start a ministry? Crazy. And can you imagine what it must have been like to walk into a boat with the sky clear blue, never seen rain, never been to an ocean, and close the door and sit there for a week and hear people having a party outside. I like to stick what is safe. You come to my closet, someone said to me, Pastor Dan, why don't you wear some other colors in your suit once in a while? You go to my closet, there's probably 10 suits. Every time I go to Thailand, buy another suit. Every time I vow, I'm going to come back with another color next time. You go to my closet, there's black, dark blue, black, dark blue, black, dark blue. That's what we do, stick to what's safe, predictable, comfortable. Noah says, crazy faith. Something different. The whole chapter, Abraham is rich. He walks away from all of it, doesn't know where he's going. Where are you going? Don't know. Walks away. Climbs to the top of a mountain to sacrifice his only son. Gideon goes from 30,000 people down to 300. Marching around the city, shouting and trumpets. The whole story of the people praying for axe heads to float and for red seas to open up. Crazy things. Is that possible still today? Is Hebrews 11 still possible today? That's the question. All right, here we go. Number one, everybody's going to have a flood sometime, right? Have you had your flood? Maybe some of you are having a flood right now. Number two, God has an ark for every flood. You agree with that? Whatever flood you're going through, God has an ark someplace. I'm not saying it's going to be easy or it's all going to be magic, but somewhere, just ask around, look around. God has an ark for you somewhere. He's prepared to deal with your flood. And number three, maybe God wants you to build an ark for someone else. Maybe you're the one that's going to fly the helicopter and go take those people out of the village. Maybe you're the one that's going to be the one to build some kind of ark to save someone from their flood. 
How do you know when it's yours? Somewhere you're a Noah for someone's flood. I don't think, I don't know if we have this video clip or not. We've had lots of trouble today. Doug put this together for me. Do you know the movie uh, Return to Me? Do you know this movie? I couldn't remember the name of it. I just knew the general story. I said to Doug, find me this clip. This wife, this man's wife dies, veterinarian. And they take her heart and give it to another lady. He doesn't know who she is and doesn't know anything about it. But somehow he ends up around her in a restaurant and somehow there begins to be an attraction. He doesn't know. Her heart is inside this other lady. We know. We're watching the movie. And he's walking by. And I just wanted to shout at him, Stop! It's her! She has your wife's heart! And gradually it takes time for him to realize this attraction. How do you know that somebody you're walking by, somewhere there's a flood, and God is trying to shout from heaven to say to you, that's yours. That's the one. That's where the flood, you're supposed to go. Go to Philippines and go do that. That's the, you're the one. Take your helicopter and go. How do you know to listen to God when he's ready for you to be the one? You're the Noah. You're the one to build an ark to go save someone from their flood. Yeah. To have that kind of faith. Somewhere there is. And this is why we're having this series. We want to be ready when God says, you're the ones to build an ark. Let's go. We want you individually to be that. We want to be that as a church. We don't want to look back at our years together and say, we could have, we should have. Should have stepped up to the plate. God was saying to you, you're the one, that's the time, there's your flood. And we passed by and we missed it. Something that God wanted us to do. We're trying to get this whole young adult ministry going into high gear. Big meetings this afternoon. You think about some of the great ministries of the world that have started by young people. Martin Luther King died at 39, at the end of it all. Started in his 20s, young preacher. God put it on his heart to march, to win equal rights by marching in civil disobedience. Marion Wright Edelman, Children's Defense Fund. Now she's in her 70s, but she started 50 years ago having a fund to help fight for kids. I've been many times to Willow Creek and Bill Hybels and heard the stories. He's talked about it. Now at my age, 19 years old, father is rich, has a huge farm outside Kalamazoo, Michigan. Gave his son Harley Davidson's and sailboats and cars, flew him all over the world. Credit card, you could get anything he wants. And Bill Hybels tells a story of walking into his father's office and saying, I think God has called me to plant a great church for God. Are you kidding? You sure? Yes. Okay, give me the cards. And he had to hand over the credit cards and slide them over the desk to his father. And now has a church, 20, 30,000, and Willow Creek copies churches all over the world. Unbelievable. Young. Thought of a young girl who had lost here when I was there, 19 years old, student body president, one of the most incredible, fantastic young ladies, Shasta. Came into my office, two young girls, and said to me, Pastor Dan, Dwight Nelson is going to have Net 98. We want to have Excite 98 before Net 98. We want 2,000 young people to come from all over and have a big weekend right here in your church. So how are you going to pay for it? God will do it. And those two young girls raised the money, did all kinds of decorations, had seminars all over the city. We had music everywhere. People came from all over the country. Two girls had a dream that God put in their heart. There's your ark we want to build. Been doing ministry for God ever since. On the other end, I'm not proud of this. I was speaking for camp meeting in Arizona years ago. My job was not to, I wasn't preaching the main 11 o'clock church service on Sabbath. Mark Finley was there. I'm just sitting there with a thousand other people. And Mark Finley began to preach. This is probably, what, late 80s, early 90s. And Mark Finley has had a burden for the big cities of the world. The great majority of the world lives in huge cities. Bangkok, Singapore, these Manila, huge cities. We're doing very little for those cities. Most of our work has been in more rural areas. 
And Mark Finley read Ellen White quotes and just talked about the cities. Mark's been working on this. Last week, Mark Finley still is uh, assistant to the president. They just voted 25 cities. They want to do evangelism. He's still caring about it. And he said, somewhere we have to have some people step up and do the big cities. I'm the pastor of the biggest church in Chicago, Hinsdale. I said, well, Chicago is the third largest city in the country. Maybe I should do something. Scared to death. I always thought Mark Finley type people should do the big meetings in Chicago, big cities. But Mark Finley can't be everywhere. I finally figured out. I know Mark Finley well. Mark Finley was just a young basketball player, came to Christ, just gradually grew level by level. I so said, maybe God wants me to step up. Vanderman's done. Richards is done. All the great giants are gone. Mark Finley's late 60s now himself. So I began to make plans to rent this huge hall, and we're going to haul the heritage singers to come in and sing, and we would do something for Chicago. Scared to death. Began to mutter about it to the elders and few people. All of a sudden, I began to hear the one lady was starting to badmouth me all through the community. Pastor Dan thinks he's going to be a big star. Pastor Dan wants to baptize a lot of people and think that he's somebody and have a picture, you know, making, just muttering. I heard about it, called her up, what's going on? She accused me of all those things. Okay, that's it. It stops right now. I stopped the whole project. No hall, no hair to singers, no meetings, no nothing. We'll call Mark Finley to come. We finally did get Mark to come for two or three days. I was talking to my friend Dwight Nelson about it. I said, Dan, that was Satan. That was Satan talking to you. It was God that was calling you to do something, to stretch, to do a Noah, to build an ark, do something great for God. It was Satan that was trying to discourage you from that. You let Satan stop you from doing something big for God. A little hard to hear. So I've had to try to think through since then. I don't want to pass by. If God's calling you to step beyond the comfortable, step beyond the safe, and the familiar, do a Noah, build a boat in the middle of a desert 500 miles from any water. Number two is what they call reverent faith. In the NIV it says Noah in holy fear. The Greek word means reverent. You take God's word seriously. Noah do not have to say to God, show me, I'm going to see some rain first, let me see a boat first. You say to do it, I will build a boat. Four times in Genesis it says that Noah did exactly what God told them to do. To the cubit, exactly. You say it, God, I'm going to do it. I listen to Bill Hybels preach about uh, the story of the Roman centurion and the servant where he says, Jesus, you don't have to come. You can just say the word and my servant will be healed. You don't have to come. I have soldiers under me. I just say the word and they do it. You can just say the word, Jesus, and it'll be good enough. And I heard Bill Hybels say, I want to be a just say the word person. Fully devoted follower of Christ. All God has to do, say the word, and I will do it. You want me to build a boat? I'll build a boat. You want me to go to a helicopter? I'll go. Are you a just say the word person? Reverent faith. And I got this idea just early this morning. Is God still speaking to people like he spoke to Noah? Yes or no? Noah was not a prophet. He's not one of the writers of the Bible. He is not canonical. He's a carpenter. And God said, I want you to build a boat. And I want to say that God still speaks to us in the same way that he spoke to Noah. And you have just as much responsibility and right to hear God, God's word, if you will take it seriously. And you'll say, if God, if you'll tell me, I'll do it. Amen. And God has an ark for you to build for somebody's flood somewhere in the world. Number three. I think there are certain levels and stages of faith. And I can only do this from my own experience, and I hope that you'll make sense out of this. And that God has certain levels of faith that you move through. One way to look at it, he talks with your, your mind. First you have to decide, is this true or not? And then it goes to your lips, like Hannah did. I confess Christ. I believe in Christ. I will get baptized goes from your mind and now you actually do something upon those beliefs and then your faith begins to go into your heart and you begin to have a relationship and you begin to just live your life for God and I want to say Noah Noah's down here at the end Noah is his holistic faith Noah is not drawing charts and trying to get all the theology words just right 
trying to get our precision in all of our understandings of grace. He doesn't care about all the Latin words, justification, sanctification, and glorification. What is the ground of our salvation? All he knows is he's for God. He lives by grace, and he's going to live his life for God. His whole life, Ellen White says, Patriarchs and Prophets 95, Noah invested everything in this building of his ark. No details, no theological details. Just, I'm for God. What are these stages of faith? For me, I think it starts, number one, is there a God? Okay, yes, faith. Second level, is he personal? Does he know me? Does he care about me? Does he aware of who I am? Is he talking to me? Yes, I am somehow, out of seven billion, significant to God, too. Number three, the next level is grace. Do you absolutely know that you are forgiven, that all your records in heaven are clean, and you have a place in heaven, your name is on the list, and there's a mansion in heaven with your name on it? Do you know it? Absolutely. That's level three. Then level four is sort of the lifestyle questions. Does God really know what he's talking about? When he says, don't, don't do that until you're married, does he know what he's talking about? If he says, try to... Date and marry within your general faith beliefs somewhere close. Does he know? If he asked you to leave a party and to leave these things behind and now go to inside a boat, because it says they were eating and drinking, they had to leave a party to go into the boat. Do you trust God that he will give you a life better than the one you walked away from? They had to walk away from a party to walk into a boat and sit there with no rain for seven days. Do you trust God enough to say he knows what he's doing? Number five, you begin to have some questions. Is God really good all the time? Lady asked me yesterday here. What about the flood, she said. How can a good God somehow and destroy the whole world? What kind of God would do that? And so the next level of faith, would you begin to wrestle with the hard questions? And you begin to try to have answers to these questions. And I said to her, God is the kind of God, he had a dream for a community of people who would love him. And there would be peace and harmony and music. And it would be this party forever. And it's falling apart. And people are killing each other and they're going to hell. And he said, if I don't do something, we're going to lose it all. And so he says, with tears in his voice, he, he starts over again and he reboots the system. Hard for God. And the other side of the story is he builds a boat big enough for anybody who wanted to go. No one had to die in the flood. The boat was big enough for anyone who wanted to go. Oh. So level five is when you begin to wrestle through the questions about God and finally decide God is good all the time. Doesn't matter what happened. Doesn't matter if he does a miracle for me today or not. Doesn't matter if I get shot. God is still good. Doesn't matter if there's some suffering in my life. Doesn't matter if we lose hair. It doesn't matter. I am still going to believe in God. Amen? We're still in. My Uncle Maury, after the end of his career, began to go around Maury Vendon and preach and tell this terrible story about this guy that died. And Maury says, I've been talking about righteousness by faith for 50 years. Do you have enough faith to still have faith in God even when things don't work out, when prayers are not answered? God is still good all the time. And then we go to level six, when you begin to stretch your life beyond what you can handle by yourself. And you begin to put more money out than you can really afford. And you begin to put kids in Christian school and you put the offerings and you begin, to, you begin to stretch and begin to say, God, I'm gonna go beyond what is normal and safe and comfortable. You begin to try new things and, and stretch out things you don't feel you can really do. And you begin to speak and you begin to care about kids and begin to serve and stretch. And then you come to level seven where you begin to find the floods that God wants you to be the ark for. And you begin to say, okay, God, if you want me to build a boat, I'll build a boat. You want me to take my little helicopter and go over there, I'll go. You want me, okay, God. Doesn't have to be in the Philippines. It can be right here. It can be anywhere. We're going to stretch. And we are determined to be a level seven church. 
I'm starting a Grace University for a bunch of young people tomorrow. I'm starting a little soul winning, how to be a lay Bible worker. You want to come? I got a group coming tomorrow night. I don't have the money. I don't know where to start. I don't know where to build a dorm. I don't know how to do any of it. But by God's grace, I'm going to build Grace University in Orange County for soul winning. I'm going to do it. We're going to start a young adult service. There are huge questions. We don't know have all the answers for. Not easy. But we are if refused to lose 80% of our young adults by the time they're 29. We refuse that. We think young adults have too much to offer God. So we're going to be level 7 church. And we're going to be ready if God calls us to take some helicopters over to the Philippines or whatever else we're going to do. Last point, are you ready? God wants you to have faith that is, first of all, based upon grace that he's already given to you. I want to say that level seven faith is, first of all, built upon grace that God has given to you at the beginning. You cannot, you cannot now look at your life and say, God, please help me do, I want these blessings, God, please bless me in the future. If you cannot have faith in what God has already done for you already in the past at the cross, you cannot trust God to do all in the future if you cannot trust God to do all the saving of your sins in the past. If you cannot believe that God was enough for you in the past, then you cannot believe that God will do enough for you in the future. It is heartbreaking to God. If you come to God and give Him your list of things you want Him to do for you, if you cannot believe absolutely, totally in the grace He's already given to you in Jesus Christ. Amen? So let's settle this today. It starts with the first levels of faith. You trust in grace, and you begin to trust levels. And as you graduate from the minor leagues, then you are ready for the major leagues when God says, I want you to build an ark for that flood. Noah has one last story in this book. It's a terrible story. Noah, after the flood, has a vineyard, and he gets drunk, and a terrible thing happens. It's the last story about Noah. He lives 350 more years. But it's the last story we hear. Noah got drunk, did a terrible thing. I hate it when I hear about people at the end of their life have some disaster, moral disaster, and that's all you ever know. They have no time to redeem it. Bill Buckner, one of the great Dodger baseball players for years, the last thing he does lets a ball go through his legs in a World Series. That's all anyone knows about Bill Buckner. Scott Norwood, great football player for years for Buffalo Bills, misses one field goal in the Super Bowl. That's all anyone knows. Scott Norwood missed the field goal. Never has a chance. Never off on the team the next year. Noah makes a terrible mistake. Ought to be off the list. Where is he? He's in Hebrews 11. Is that good? Are you thankful for grace that covers all the mistakes? God does not go by some mistake you make at the end of your life. He goes by your heart. He goes by grace. And he saves you by grace. And Noah and Abraham, all these people who made terrible mistakes, they're all in the hall of fame. Are you thankful for that? They won't let Pete Rose into the Hall of Fame. They won't let Barry Bonds into the Hall of Fame. Made mistakes. And God works on a different system. God is a God of grace. Do you have enough faith to believe in a God of grace? My father died 10 years ago this week. We had a big deal on Tuesday. We had it on Sunday night. The whole family, all of us were there around the cemetery. Everyone was there. Played the guitar. I was saying a few things. Had prayer. <laughs> then my crazy brother comes up to me and he says, did you hear the joke? I wasn't sure he should be telling a joke, but he did. He said, did you hear the joke about the guy put it on the Craigslist? It's tombstone for sale. $50. Perfect if your name is Lyndon Schwartz. <laughs> <laughs> Thought about that. I don't know who Lyndon Schwartz is. But can you imagine you've already, you know you're going to die, you're in the hospital, you got cancer, you're going to die, and you got your tombstone ready to go. When all of a sudden you get the idea, I'm not going to die. I refuse to die. And by faith, you begin to turn around and you begin to live. And you decide you're not going to die. And you're going to sell your tombstone. And just say, I don't need a tombstone anymore. Someone else, Lind Lyndon Schwartz, can have my tombstone. Is that good? Amen. Have you sold your tombstone? Do you have enough faith to say, I am not going to die second death. I am going to live forever because of the grace of Jesus Christ. 
sell your tombstone for the glory of God. Amen? God be with you.